The history of the whaling industry is a fascinating and often tragic tale of human ingenuity and exploitation. From the early days of hunting whales with hand-thrown harpoons to the advent of modern industrial whaling, the story of whaling is one of both technological and economic progress and the devastation of an ecosystem. The whaling industry introduced people to the idea of consistent illumination at their whim and the conquering of the night, bringing entire communities to build their economies around the practice of hunting whales. Eventually, it would begin to take its toll on the waters around New England. But that wasn't what led to the end of whaling. So what did? Light up your candles as we learn something new. People have been whaling for a very long time. Norwegians were among the first to hunt whales, as early as 4,000 years ago. Though groups as varied as the Inuit, Basque, and Japanese relied on whales to provide them with food and tools. In these times, nearly every part of the whale was used. Meat, skin, blubber, and organs were eaten as an important source of protein, fats, vitamins, and minerals. Baleen was woven into baskets and used as fishing line, and the bones could be used for making tools as well. During the Middle Ages and Renaissance, whaling gained popularity throughout Northern Europe. Whale oil and baleen were valuable commodities. Whale oil, coming from the right bowhead and sperm whales, was initially used for oil lamps. And over time, European whaling ventures spread to North America. And that's where it would thrive. Though the 1600s would see the start of massive whaling efforts, especially in places like Cape Cod, the 1700s would see a noticeable decline in the whale population near normal hunting spots, which meant that in order to continue the hunting spree, they would need to go further out. But the American Revolution would quickly put a stop to that, as the British Navy blockaded the American ports and began harassing any American ships that left on the high seas. So during the American Revolutionary War, whaling came to a grinding halt, leading many to speculate that the whale population actually was allowed the breathing room to start its recovery during this time. But it wouldn't have long. After the war ended, American whalers quickly dropped their guns and picked up their harpoons once again. In 1846, just five years before the famous novel Moby Dick was published, the United States was leading the world in whaling. A whopping 640 whaling ships were deployed and on the prowl. This was more than triple the combined numbers of the rest of the world. At its height, the whaling industry contributed $10 million, making it the fifth largest sector of the economy not quite as large as the Ice King's second largest sector of the economy, which you can learn about here, but still an undeniably huge piece of the pie, especially when considering how concentrated the practice was, with the majority of all whaling on the planet revolving around one city, New Bedford, Massachusetts, the so-called city that lit the world. From 1816 to 1850, the U.S. whaling industry grew by a factor of 14, and over half of that was localized in New Bedford, making it the richest city per capita in the United States, arguably the richest in the world. Of the 640 ships mentioned earlier, nearly 400 called the ports of New Bedford their home. Demand for whale products was coming from all over. Sperm whale oil could lubricate the new machinery of the Industrial Revolution, and even less desirable types of whale oil could still be used in candles to light rooms or streets. The captains who resided in New Bedford when they weren't at sea had some of the largest houses in the best neighborhoods. The popularity of whaling and the products that it could produce led to significant improvements in technology. Everything from bigger and better ships to better harpoon technology, to winch technology used to move extraordinarily heavy objects, and even to the innovation in how employees were managed. With captains signing the sailors not for a specified wage as was normal for the time, but rather for a percentage of the profits after they had returned home. But if things were going so well, what could bring the industry crumbling down? Well, surprisingly, it wasn't a lack of whales, but rather an economy that outgrew them. 
While yes, there were a large amount of whales hunted, with the overall figure being over 100,000, which some state is more than were hunted in the previous 400 years combined, and importantly there were very much fears at the time of the supply of whales being hunted to extinction, it didn't appear to be the driving force of the slowdown. It was actually more so attributed to two different reasons, one on the supply side and the other on demand. Using whale oil as a source of energy was intensive and dangerous, not to mention expensive, but around this same time a new commodity was entering the picture, petroleum oil. While in 1859 the US was producing barely 2,000 barrels of oil a year, in just 40 years the oil industry was producing 2,000 barrels of oil every 17 minutes. But a shift in demand wasn't all, because as of the late 50s, Oil production hadn't scaled as much yet, but whale oil production continued to fall in America. So what happened? Well, in a somewhat ironic case of history repeating itself, US workers became too expensive to justify investments into whaling, at least in America. It was dangerous work, which would eventually call for higher pay, and with the plentiful amounts of somewhat safer work on dry land coming from the Industrial Revolution, there were higher wages, more opportunities, and plenty of entrepreneurial endeavors that were more of a surefire way to success. In fact, between the 1860s and 80s, the Norwegian whaling industry was beginning to take off, and it made more sense as it was three times more expensive to hire US workers for whaling than Norwegian seamen. Within a few decades of whaling becoming the fifth largest industry in the United States, it had all but disappeared within its borders. Today, it's easy to think that the economic leaders will always be that way forever, but there's been so many times in the past where new, unanticipated, and disruptive technologies and innovations change the way we live our lives. So here's my question to you, the viewer. What industry do you think could be on the verge of a disruption? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching Learn Something New. Like and subscribe for more content, and I will see you in the next one.